Well, good morning, folks. Good morning. Hey, it's so beautiful out, isn't it? So beautiful out. So yesterday afternoon, okay, uh, I, I was leaving the church, and I was just going to go, go home for a little bit, and a car pulls in. I thought oh, they were going to go to the pantry, and I said, oh, no, there's nothing in the pantry. That's all I could think. Well, and, and, all the, and it starts pouring rain on me. And I go, I'm sorry, there's nothing here. And this woman opens up the back door. She had boxes of food. She was coming with boxes of food to put in the pantry. So I, it was so cool. There I am getting rained on. I tell her, get in your car. Thank you so much. I got soaked. It was great. Turns out I dry out pretty well. But it was so cool to think one thing and realize, she's come, just know this is all for the pantry. Isn't that cool? It is. It was just like a cleansing rain. It was so cool. But we're here today, and it's a beautiful day. We've come to worship here at Calvary Baptist Church. Please stand with us in his praise team. They're going to lead us in song. of our God and King, lift up your voice with us and sing, oh praise Him, Alleluia. Christ alone, my hope is found. 
He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled and striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness. Scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, but with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life. No fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. He returns and calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Amen. Standing in the power of Christ, folks. Standing in the power of Christ. Hey, folks, I wave to each other, give everyone a high, but I would ask all the children from Sunday school today to come on up front. Come on and bring your capes. And then, please, please, folks, after you wave, have a seat. I got a treat. Have a seat. Come on up here. You have your capes. Roman, do you have your cape? Okay, well, come on up anyways. Annie, come on up. Come on up. Everyone. Everyone, let, now let's look at, now, where, where's, your, where's your capes? Hold your cape up or turn your back so they can see your capes. Let's see your capes. Look at these capes. See these capes? These capes are super Jesus. This is a fruit of the Spirit. And they've been studying it and studying it, and we got pictures. Isn't that cool? They get to wear these capes. Uh, and probably all day long, wouldn't you? I certainly would. So I just wanted you to see what the children were doing because it's just cool. Thank you guys so much. Oh, another cape. Roma cape. You got to have your cape too, honey. And, and, and I just have one question. Does anyone have a smartphone? A smartphone. You know those things that take pictures? Have you heard of them? Would someone please take a picture of these ch children? Come together a little bit, please. Come together just a little bit. Hold, your, hold those up. Yep, that's good, honey. That's good. You can, you can either way, or you can face too. Go, we can go both ways. And now just take a picture. I want these. Hold up those capes. All right? Alex, turn around a little bit. Turn a little bit, Alex. Show your cape. Good, both ways. Perfect. All right, thank you, guys. All right, you can get on to junior church, all right? Thank you. You can go see mommy.
And ooh, ooh, I'm not done. I remembered things. So, folks, I have here, this is a, a prayer gram, okay? Remember, prayer grams, we, we fill these out. There's something on here, and we send it to someone that might be in need, that might have a prayer request or to say something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to Joanna first. All I, I wrote a little something here. Could you just sign on this? What is this for? This is for our friends down at 7-Eleven that pro provide us food every single day for the pantry. At 7 o'clock this morning, I got food for them and it went in the pantry. Every day, do that. So I just want us, as we're all of 100 yards apart, to just give them a thank you. for. This. So just write say something in here. Thank you for your gift, whatever comes to mind. If you have a verse, if you want to write a longer note, go crazy. I don't care. But let them know that you appreciate what they've done. And, and just pass this around during service, okay? No jumping jacks. Uh, and during service and or afterwards. But uh, it's just so cool what they do. It really is. It really is. Ah, here we are. Here we are. Oh, just one more note. So I'm wearing a tie today. I don't mean to complain about the brethren or the sisterin, but I had just a white shirt on today. And a couple of people who will remain unnamed, Joanna and Anne Marie, they complained. So they sent me home. I had to get like seven ties. And then we had to have like a, a, a vote, okay? Ballot counting. I talk about this. It, and so I got this tie on today. Just want you to know. I hope you like it. I've got a lot of compliments already. Let's get to the message. Get to the message. Okay, this morning, baptism, a family affair. A family affair, it's there. So we're going to, you know, it's a, baptism is a family affair, even from the perspective, if you're in the family of God, isn't it? Baptism is a family affair. We're going to look a little bit more into this as well, get into this text. But I just wanted you to note something. When you go into John chapter 3, where we're at right now, and you hit verse 22, it's kind of funny. You know how when you read the Bible, there's chapter breaks? One, two, three. I really think at, chapter, at verse 22, it should be chapter 4 because there's an abrupt change in the topic. Before this, Jesus was speaking. It's a whole monologue about being born again, about stepping out of darkness into light. And then what you'll see today changes right into John uh, uh, the Baptist and his disciples in a dialogue about why Jesus is baptizing more than them. It's kind of strange. So... Does that mean anything? No, I just want to point it out. Okay? Just a piece of information. It's Pete's opinion. Take it for what it's not worth. But uh, I want to get into this text here and take a look at this, see what's happening, with, not so much even with baptism, but the dialogue that's taking in place behind the baptism, what's going on in John's disciples' minds and hearts. It's so important. So we'll jump into our text because that's where we should go first. John chapter 3, verse 22. And after these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea. And there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in Enon, near Salim, because there was much water there. They came and they were baptized. For John had not yet been thrown in prison. And there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. So important when you look at the dialogue that's taking place in this text. But let's have a word of prayer before we go any further. Father, I thank you for this beautiful day you've given us. I thank you for every day that you give us, Lord, because actually every day is beautiful, because it's from you. Every day is a gift. Everything is gift, Lord. Everything is gift that comes from you. Father, I thank you that I can present your word. Father, please help me to say it the way that it should be said with your intent behind it, not mine. Thank you, Lord. Amen. All right. So our text started off in verse 22. It says, after these things. After what things? Well, if you haven't noticed, I like maps, OK? So I need to relate to maps to see where things are happening, because a lot has happened in John so far, OK? Do you recall that Jesus has came, he came to John the Baptist down here in Bethany on this side of the Jordan River, and he was baptized. And immediately, he went off into the wilderness 
okay, to fast for 40 days and 40 nights was tempted of Satan. Then he came back to Bethany here, or maybe somewhere up along the Jordan River. I don't know. It doesn't say exactly. And John the baptizer says, behold, the Lamb of God. John the Baptist identifies who Jesus was, the Lamb of God. And if you recall, uh, then I believe he, from that point there, he picks out some of his disciples. I think it was like uh, Andrew, Peter, Philip, Nathaniel, and probably John. They, they're chosen to follow him at some, to some degree because it's a much deeper degree as we get further into the Gospels. But then Jesus goes to Jerusalem at the first Passover. So the way we figure out how long Jesus was on earth is by the Passovers, three Passovers. This is the first one that he goes to where he's actually active, if you will, okay? He turns over the tables. <laughs> he turns over the tables at this, and, and, and he runs the money changers out. And at the same time, he does miracles in the temple. He does signs and wonders. And in Jerusalem here, this is where he meets with uh, Nicodemus, and he tells him, you must be born again. So these are some of the things that had happened. And now we get to our text. He's somewhere out here in the land of Judea. He leaves Jerusalem. I don't know where. It doesn't say. I put the question mark a little bit near the Jordan River because they were baptizing, right? It had to be water. Concurrently, John the Baptist with his disciples are in Enon, uh, up here. Now, the exact location of it's not clear, okay? But I imagine what had happened as John was moving and doing things my, I imagine he probably traveled up the eastern side of the Jordan River because Jews did not travel through Samaria, right? We'll get to that to ch in chapter 4 of John. But the point being that John is up here now doing this. And this is the things that have already occurred. Now we've reached this point right here because a lot has happened. A lot has happened in all this traveling. And John the Baptist, he is fulfilling that prophecy of one crying in the wilderness, wasn't he? He's making straight the way of the Lord. That's what he's doing. He's baptizing people for the repentance of sin. Okay? Even though Jesus has come earlier in chapter 3 and told Nicodemus, you must be born again to see heaven, John's still on his mission. Baptizing people for the forgiveness of sin is very important for them. People need to realize this. They do. Now, of the certain family, Jesus and John the Baptist are the same family, folks. I put this picture up here. I just like the picture. I thought it was a little artsy. But it depicts what? The younger woman is Mary. The older woman is Elizabeth. Elizabeth was the mother of John the Baptist. Mary is the mother of Jesus. Luke chapter 1, verse 35 says they're related. They had a very close relationship, okay? The point being that Jesus and John are related somewhat closely. First, second, third cousins, I don't know. It doesn't say. It doesn't matter. They're from the same family. It's kind of interesting to go to. So this is a family affair. Something's happening in this family, if you really think about it. As we go into this text, it says that Jesus remained with them, remained with his disciples. Out, he's out in the land of Judea, if you will, somewhere, and he's with his disciples. He tarried with them. He abode with them. He stayed with them. And I was looking up the meaning of that word. It's kind of weird. Bible translations are so important, the way that translators translate it, because that word tarried in the boat, it really means to, like, rub away. I said, what? Rub away? Rub away? And I was looking into it, and I came to the realization, if you're with someone and stuff, what are you doing? You're rubbing shoulders. You're rubbing elbows. I think that's where the expression comes from. He was right with them. He was right with them. Jesus is with them. He was immersed in their lives. He's spending time with his disciples. It was so important. It was so important for him to do that. I think one of the things we should keep in mind when we read the Bible is there are great time periods in between the different events that occur that Jesus is doing. Okay? It's not always bang, 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 right? He did this, he did that, he did this. The one place you see that is you get to the Passion Week before Christ is crucified. In the Passion Week, so many things happened. It's amazing. Amazing. But in general, there's great periods of time, months perhaps, they were out in the countryside of Judea baptizing people. We don't know. It doesn't say. But they're out there, and he's spending time with them. And it was interesting, just to skip ahead, to cheat a little bit. In John uh, chapter two, 4, verse 2, it says, Jesus wasn't baptizing anyone. I always thought that was interesting. It's sort of explicit. They were baptizing, but Jesus wasn't. It's interesting. Maybe we'll figure it out. Maybe we won't. 
I don't know. I don't know. But baptism, this baptism that's taking place, this is foreshadowing of what we would call the Christian baptism. Kind of a strange way of putting at it, but think of it. The baptism that we go, we know when we pull the baptistry out from behind the curtains, you know, the man behind the curtains and we baptize someone. We're baptizing, identifying with, with Jesus, with his death, burial, and resurrection. But this water, this baptism, this purification, this has been around for centuries. Centuries. This purification, this ritual was practiced by Judaism for centuries. Now comes along John the Baptist, and he's proclaiming, he's preaching to repent for the remission of sins, to repent from sin, right? That he's preaching. Repent from sin. Stop sinning. And this will eventually progress into the, the baptism that we are familiar with presently. Presently. That, pres that, that one that we see that occurs after the, after the ascension of Jesus Christ. The one that I like to see in this picture. I always enjoy this picture of this, of this young person being baptized coming up out of the water. In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, it tells us about this baptism. Do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, we're baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. I just love the picture because this young person's popping up. They've got their eyes closed, but if that hands up, you know, it's like a newness of life. I just enjoy that picture so much. Now, John the Baptist, he's the, he's the last, if you will, of the Old Testament prophets. He's the last one. It's like the ending of an age with John the Baptist. His job was to make the road clear, straight, wide open for Jesus to come. For Christ. The Christ that people were waiting for. The Christ that they got might not have been the Christ that they anticipated, but it is the Christ, and he made the way ready for them. And it continues into what we're not to dispute, but an interesting dialogue that takes place with his disciples. Because it's hard for them. It says, it's two parts to this. He says, then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you, that's Jesus, beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, because he testified to him as the Lamb of God, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. Ouch, they're going to him. I see in this a twofold dispute, if you will, a twofold dispute, okay? First, John's disciples are hearing it from the Jews, from the Jews. It's like hearing it from your old family, isn't it? Like hearing it from your old family. You ever notice how when family members give, give each other the business, there's no filter? It's ugly, isn't it? There is no filter between brothers and sisters. It is ugly. And that's, I think, what we're seeing right here, no filters. They're just giving it to him. Hey, what's this baptism all about? Who do you think you are operating outside the, 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 the confines of the temple? Right? This is, and, and understand, this Anon, where the, where the disciples are at, this is 20, 30, or 40 miles away from Jerusalem. These people had to travel to give them a hassle. They had to do this. And I thought of this, and I started this, I said, hmm. This is sort of like what the Pharisees did to Jesus at times, didn't they? What did they say? What did the Pharisees say to him? Who's your teacher? By whose authority are you teaching this? Isn't that what they said to Jesus? By whose authority are you teaching this? They were trying to discredit Jesus. The Pharisees tried to take the Holy Spirit, uh, script, the Holy Spirit inspired scriptures and present it back to Jesus like throwing stones at him, right? You can't use the word of God that way with loving kindness. We're in control here. It didn't work out well for them, did it? It never did for these guys. They didn't understand it. Do you remember the woman caught in adultery? What happened to her? They break the woman before Jesus? Jesus, we caught her in adultery. We got a stoner, right? The law says to stone her. They were pretty pumped about this, I think. And Jesus just looks at him. OK, whoever doesn't have any sin, you throw the first stone. See, he was bringing across the intent of what the Word of God was about. And of course, they sort of slunk off, didn't they? Yeah. And what did he say to the woman? Don't sin anymore. Go your way. 
He didn't rail on her, did he? He was applying the word of God the way it was intended to, not with the hardness that we can do in our hearts. You see, Israel's adherence to the covenant had degraded the external forms of superficial morality. Uh, morality was, was just prevalent. There was mechanical ceremony. There was legalistic rituals, rituals and extraneous traditions. Extraneous traditions. My job is to make sure that we don't get any extraneous traditions in our church. That's my job. One of my jobs. We can't have that. There's so many essential things that we need to stay focused on. We don't have time for the extraneous, the silliness. We need to weed those out among ourselves. It mean, we need to do what our Father would have us do, not the things that are extraneous. And this comes to my mind all the time. The dispute missed what baptism of repentance was all about. That's what they were missing, okay? Facing your sin. And we've discussed this before, and I got the same picture. I had to show it to you again. The mikvah. Remember I said that these, these ritual purification had gone on for centuries. That is an act on the, on the left, a, a, a baptismal pool, we would call it, a mikvah, that's outside of Jerusalem. There's hundreds of them from that time frame because people were being ritually cleaned all the time. It's part of Jewish culture. That's what they did. So this baptism, you know, getting clean with water was not new. It was not new to them. And of course, on the right, that's the mikvah I want to go into. It's got a little chlorine smell in there. It's probably heated. And I'd like it, right? That, but that's a current day because people still practice this. It's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. But you see, this baptism we're talking about, this immersion, the one that John the Baptist and his disciples are talking about has a little twist to it that's raising eyebrows. This is for repentance of sin. Wait a sec, we do sacrifices. I don't understand. What's this repentance you're talking about, right? The problem was that the sacrifices were no longer for repentance, were they? They became rituals, ceremonies. They've actually become an extraneous tradition. That's what they become. Underlying all of this, these, 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 these Jews that came to dispute with them, was the concept of purification. That was being questioned. But I don't think it really was the question. I really don't. Because remember, Jesus did say earlier in verse 19, men love darkness rather than light. We love darkness rather than light. What was their thought? What do we need to repent of, right? What do we repent of? I'm doing everything I need to do. I'm doing my sacrifices. I'm OK. I'm good. Rich young ruler. Remember the rich young ruler? He came to Jesus, Rabbi, Master, I keep the big 10. I'm doing everything I should. What else do I need to get to heaven? What did Jesus tell him? Give away everything you got to the poor. Follow me. I think follow me is a very scary statement in Christendom. Follow me. Are you following Jesus? Am I following Jesus? What does that mean? The rich young ruler had to give away everything. Would we? Would I? Have I? What am I holding on to that's between me and Christ? Yeah. These things come to mind when I look at this. What else do I need to do? And you know what it's sort of like what's happening at this time frame? You know, and, and this is all I can think of. Have you ever been asleep in a nice dark room and you're comfy? You know, you're just out. The curtains are pulled and someone turns on a light. You know the feeling. What did you do that for? You get pulled out of a deep sleep. You're kind of foggy and you're irritated, aren't you? You are. It's really irritating to get knocked out of a nice deep sleep, isn't it? Particularly on a Sunday afternoon if I'm having a good one. But you know what happens? You get irritated. Well, there was a lot being exposed at this time. There really was. Jesus went to the temple. He tipped to the temple and tipped over the tables. Things are being exposed. Jesus met with Nicodemus. He said, you must be born again. Things are being exposed. That's what's happening here. There's a huge exposure taking place. So there's a picture of our church, Calvary Baptist Church. OK, that's an old picture. Note that the big oak trees are still out on the side out here before we took them down. I wanted to get an old picture. I always got these pictures. I like that picture. But uh, in our worship services, right, are we looking for purification, conviction, and truth? Is that what we're looking for? Are we looking for nice words when you come here, right? Think about it for a minute. 
Perhaps you come here and things are reinforced that you learned when you were a young child. Things you were taught to you, right? They're reinforced. I'm saying things that you are familiar with, right? But am I saying things that are in accord with God's word? Do you ever go home and check my messages out? You ever look at my verses? If you want, I can always email you my message. You can check it out. It's important, I think. You know what happens when I hear someone speak? If I'm in the pews, wherever I go, I'm either flipping my Bible or, or flicking on my phone. And if you go to verse 14, whatever it is, I'm reading from verse 10 to 18. I want to know that, we're the con that, that the words that are being presented to me are in context. It's really important to me. Okay, I try to do my best not to pull things out of context to prove a point. I think the word of God's got enough points in it. Let it prove itself. But that can happen. So I honestly hope that you check up on me because I need it. I need that. That's loving me if you check up on me and, my, my, and the verses I'm using. It's very, very important. Because in Christendom, there's a lot of denominations out there, aren't there? All these denominations. I think it's fair to say that the divisions are perpetuated based on the reinforcement of what people have been taught rather than by the power of the Holy Spirit working in their lives through the Word of God. Do you agree with that statement? Because I feel strongly about it. I feel very strongly about that statement. I was taught this. I was taught that. Have I measured that teaching against the Word of God? Have I? Have you? Or is it just a good sales job? Everyone like a good sales job, right? Don't you, you hate that? You buy that car and you do like I did, and you find out it doesn't have cruise control. Ugh. That's okay, it's a 2007. It's going to be an antique soon. You see, the overarching concept of loving people through sacrifice is taught throughout the Bible Old Testament and New Testament. Is that the perceptive that you were taught and that I was taught? Loving people through sacrifice? And if it has been taught, is it active in our lives? Was it taught but not caught? Taught but not caught. I love that little line. Now, we all know that line. But isn't it profound, the things we get taught? Because, see, we maintain biases, thoughts, loyalties, and prejudices, right? We can maintain them faithfully, can't we? Folks, i got to tell you, I get crazy. Er, maybe I have to get crazy. I speak with people. And I speak with them, and they're talking about things that happened to them five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Can you get over it? Can you forgive the person? I thought you said you're a Christian. Why are you living in 25 years ago? What happened then? But people will live in these times. Do you realize that you, can't, you cannot serve God living 25 years ago? You can't. Your heart is divided, and I hear this all the time, all the time. See, the Jews were questioning John's disciples. They were faithful to what they were taught. But I don't think they really caught the message that was in the scripture that they should have. Inner feelings and concepts are the result, the result in divisions that we perpetuate regarding the word of God. Imagine this. And I was going to do this, but I didn't. I was going to go around Dedham and take pictures of all the church buildings. And I was going to put them up in my little slideshow. Be cool, right? But I figured if anyone's going to, if that's what anything's going to create trouble in our, in, our, in our town, that would be it, okay? You're calling out my church. No, I'm not. I'm calling out all churches. Imagine of all the houses of faith, of whatever you want to call it, uh, whatever you want to call them, right, these churches, if all of them had their collective bias put aside, all of our biases, and then we came to the word of God. All the biases, all the things you may have been taught were put, and then we come to the word of God. All those preconceived notions. Suppose we started here in the book of John. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. We start right there. Okay, it's beautiful, beautiful text. We start in the, the gospel of John because it is the gospel of love. We start there. Right? Will we believe what we say we believe I want to still? Us. Would I change? Would other people change? You see, we have Christ, but so often we can add to Christ. We can do it right here in our worship service, folks. We can let things slip in. 
Not only that, we can stop some things from coming in that should be here, right? Think about that. There's things we maybe should be doing that, oh, we can't do that because, because why, <laughs> right? Think about that sometimes. The word of God prohibit it, why not do it? Imagine the liberation from a works-based worship system. Works-based worship systems to get to heaven are a plague in Christendom. It just are. Imagine truly seeing people as lost souls. As we said in the men's Bible study uh, 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 Monday night, imagine if we saw lost souls like a lost child, right? You know when we see a lost child, crying child, you, you get pretty amped up, right? Imagine a mother came through that door right now. And she said, I lost my child. Please help me. Do you think the message would stop? I think it would. We would jet out of here in a heartbeat. I'd run to the river first because I'd be thinking the child's in the river. I'm just telling you that's how my mind works. Do we see lost souls like lost children? Because we see a lost child, our hearts are just twisted instantly, that crying child. Imagine the removal of preconceived notions that translate so readily into judgment. Oh, you dress like that, so you must be like this. That one kills me. I wore jeans today. Ooh, I'm going to burn. Yeah, come on. Can we get over it? Wouldn't it be beautiful if we could get rid of some of these preconceived notions? It really would be. John's disciples were in a dispute with a stale, spiritually permeated Israel. Their religion had become stale. It was stale. But the question is, is ours fresh? It's easy to do this, right? Point. But we need to, this is, that, that's there for our, our learning, isn't it? Are we fresh? Are we good? Are we keeping it real? Because are we any less vulnerable to what they were? No, we're not. We're not any less vulnerable. Their people were all people. We're all identical. We're all identical. You know, I'm taller than you. No, we're identical. That's not what it's all about. These people are disputing purification. They needed to understand that change was coming. The change was already there. The old covenant was not the ultimate means of, sal of sa salvation. The sacrifices needed to be repeated annually. They did. Think about it. Burnt offerings, peace offerings, and sin offerings. Sin offerings were mandatory for in Judaism every single year. They were mandatory. They were all good. They were all of God. And though Christ has not been died yet and gone to the cross, right, his sacrifice was very, very good. See, the law that these Jews were under then and the laws that we have now, what are they there for? They bring us to realize our sinfulness and God's holiness. That's what it's about. Baptism that was taking place was about repentance from sin and turning to God. That was John the Baptist's job. That's what he was supposed to do, and he was doing it well. Jesus came and fulfilled the law. Only through his sacrifice is forgiveness possible. The Holy Spirit in a, in a, the Holy Spirit in a person is the covenant relationship that we need to enter into the kingdom of God. It's so important. But the second dispute that was taking place here was John's disciples uh, feeling like they were losing a contest, weren't they? And that's very natural, isn't it? It's in verse 26, he says, they came to John and said, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. They're coming to Jesus. They're not going to him. You see, they were trying to figure out what was going on. Something's gone wrong, John. What's happening here? We need a better marketing plan. John, uh, John, we need a better website. People are going over there, right? You can see the mentality. What's happening? John the Baptist's popularity was waning. It was supposed to. That was the plan. In Mark chapter 1, it says, John came baptizing in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all in the land of Judea, and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. See, all were going then, but it's all changing now. It's all changing. God's plan put John in a perfect position to overlap with Jesus' ministry, the Lamb of God. Remember, they were born like six months apart, weren't they? This is not random chance happening. 
This is a plan. And the disciples' reaction was very human, right? You got more than me. That's what we do, right? So last Sunday, we had the movie downstairs, Sabina, and we got pizzas. Oh, guys, I'm such a sinner. I, can't, I hate pizza. You know why? Because it it's, they're not all cut equally. So when I see a pizza cut, I look for the big piece. I'm glad you're laughing because that means you do the same thing. But isn't it true? Isn't it true? At my third piece, I was OK with a smaller part piece. But it's just what we do. I understand John's disciples, they were doing something that was very good. They were, they, they're, they're coming to John and they're saying, we're doing, we're, we're, they're saying, we care for these people. We are disciples, Rabbi. Why are the people going to Jesus? John's disciples are involved in this new movement. They put it all on the line. People were coming to John for baptism. Now they're going to Jesus. Hey, how would you feel if you had your business and all of a sudden Amazon moves in and you're squashed? It's sort of what's happening, isn't it? They're going down. Jesus is coming up. But that was the plan. That was the plan. John and his disciples were worshiping outside the temple, and they were sort of outside the guardrails of Judaism. They were just putting it all on the line. They really were. There really weren't two competing camps. There really weren't. The word of God was progressive here. John was doing what God had ordained him to do. That's what is his job. And John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless he is given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness. And I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He's just reclarifying while he's there. They're a little confused. He's giving them some, some, something there. Can we grasp what he's saying, how beautiful it is and amazing it is, John's statement? It's received from heaven. It's received from above. Being born again is being born from above. John knows where the source of everything is coming from. It's coming from God. In James 1.17, it says, Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation nor shadow of turning. See, God doesn't change. God is always faithful. 1 Corinthians 1.9, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God is, our faith needs to be placed in God, not in each other. We love each other. Put our trust in God. John understood that God's sovereignty had granted him the role that he had to go before Jesus Christ. John understood that. One crying in the wilderness. He cried in the wilderness figuratively and actually, didn't he? Because he was out in the wilderness, the wilderness of Judea. He actually he was outside of Judea in Bethany the first time, where he was first baptizing. And John's disciples, I think they felt abandoned. They felt left behind. Because remember, they don't know anything about that conversation that took place between Jesus and Nicodemus, do they? John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. They don't know this, do they? They're just doing what they were supposed to do. Baptizing people for repentance. That's what they were doing. John's disciples are operating on the premise and on the knowledge that people need, really need to repent for their sin. And they were legit. What they were doing is not nullified one bit. The baptism they provided was a public profession, proclamation. And it was good. What's revealed can be resolved, okay? If we leave things in darkness, they can't be resolved. You need to come out and repent of your sin is what they were telling people. And John the Baptist told them, I'm not the Christ. The disciples, uh, what, the, disciples, the disciples were told that John was sent before Christ. But you see, they see the crowds going to Jesus. They're human, just like us. Just like us, they're human. Recall, Paul had a similar instance in Corinthians. He really did. And in 1 Corinthians 1.12, it says, Now I say this, that each of you says, I am a Paul, I am a Paulus, I am a Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? See, Paul was pointing out their misguided allegiances that they had, the Corinthians. Paul's telling them, was I crucified for you? Are you being baptized in my name? It's a real wake-up call, isn't it? It really was for them. 
John told him, I'm not the Christ. See, the vertical relationship needs to be in place. Then we can have a real horizontal relationship. If we get the vertical right with God, then we can really love each other sacrificially. But until this between us and God gets straight, we really can't love each other the way we're called to. I find this a great help. Paul's statement brings balance back to my life. When my mind goes wandering to myself, which it does more than once a day, me in control of everything in my life or anything in my life, I remember that it was Christ that was crucified and suffered. Remember, Christ was abandoned on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That just chills me every time I think of it. Salvation is not the deliverance of sin, being sanctified, or personal holiness, though they all result from salvation. Salvation is deliverance out of self, into himself. Salvation means the Spirit of God has brought me in touch with God's personality because the Spirit resides inside me. I understand there's something truly, infinitely greater than me, and that it is God. That's what Jesus was teaching Nicodemus. He was teaching him, being born from above. He told him, let go of the temple. Remember, he was worshiping in the temple, poor Nicodemus. In 70 AD, that temple is gone. It's destroyed. Think of this for a minute. The temple grounds over in Israel, they're a hotbed of conflict, aren't they? To this day, this is what, 2,000 years later? People will go to war over that piece of earth if you give them the opportunity to, right? Isn't that kind of crazy? The desire to worship there, worship God there, is enough to make you kill someone. Can, can you see love in that? Because I can't. I just miss it. I miss it altogether, all the time. Can't we see the brilliance of God ordaining us as a temple of the Holy Spirit? We can worship wherever we go. We're beholden to no one, only to God. We are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And we can't take any credit for it. That's even more liberating. It's even more liberating, isn't it? It's just wonderful. No man can receive, no man can receive nothing unless it is given to him from heaven. That was John. That's what he said. We hold on to things in the world so tightly, folks. We really do. We hold on to family traditions, political alignments, vacation locations, where my child's going to go to college. We hold on to these things so closely. We need to hold on to things a, a lot more loosely. We're in this world doesn't mean to meet, we need to be of this world. We're here, but let's not be of this world. <laughs> John's ministry is coming to an end. John is in Christ. He has no disappointment. He has no dissatisfaction. There's no, oh, I wish I could have, right? You don't find that, do you? Because, because it was not John doing the ministry, but it came from above, and he understood that. Did you catch that? The ministry came from above, and John understood that, and that's what's amazing. We understand ministry comes from God. Service comes from God. The measure of a ministry is not how many people follow the minister, but how many people follow Christ. John was all about people following Christ. I must decrease so he can increase. What an incredible perspective to have of oneself, isn't that? It certainly is. The ministry of God, we get to participate in it. We get to participate in it. It's an amazing thing. We get to come to church. Folks, this is why it's a family affair, being in the family of God. Being a child of God, that makes us joint heirs with Christ. Every, everything among God's servants, including popular ministry, is a gift from God. It's not of Paul. It's not of Apollos. It's not of Cephas. It's of Christ. It's not anything that we're entitled to. Understand, this is what Thanksgiving, come, how Thanksgiving comes into a person's life. When a gift is received, there's great thanks in it. 
That is how we have to live our lives. That's how John was living his life. It didn't make any difference that Christ was coming up. It was a beautiful thing to him. He knew what it meant. We need to understand what that means. and Be willing to share the gift that we have been given. It's so powerful, folks. So when we see that person out there lost, maybe think of the lost child. These children just came in the room, didn't they? Could you imagine any one of them lost? We'd go after them, wouldn't we? We'd find them. We'd find that lost sheep, wouldn't we? Think of that when we see that lost world out there. Because that's what we're here for now. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you for this day, Father. I thank you for your goodness. And thank you made so real to us, Lord, of what John's disciples would have felt seeing his ministry going down, though they were all in, Lord. And John just tells them, it's not about him. It's all from you, Lord. The liberty, Father, we can have in that. I pray that my brothers and sisters will understand the liberty we have when we understand that everything is from you. We don't have to have that responsibility on our shoulders. We need to trust in you. I thank you and praise you, Jesus, for this day. Amen. Amen. Wow. All good. The program's still going around. That's good. That's good. So uh, you're, we're going to have some announcements scrolling up here now so you can start to see what's going on. Okay, I'm going to try and get that up there. Ladies' Bible studies this week. If you want to be part of that, you know, and you're not on that, let me know. I'll get you, the, get you on the Zoom link. Okay, this summer we already have charted July 25th to July 29th our vacation Bible school. Now you know when we do vacation Bible school, we don't do it here. We go somewhere. Eric Briscoe from Open Air Campaigners is going to be here, and he's got an entire team from Michigan coming to do our vacation Bible school with us and for us. That's pretty cool. Eric got it all set up. Okay, I got a text from him this week. And he said, would that be OK? I couldn't click my phone fast enough. OK? I said, it's on the board. So we go back, I got AOC, July 25th to the 29th. So they'll be here. And uh, I'm just excited about that. Eric's excited about becoming. He's uh, what a great gift he is. Uh, hopefully before then, I'll have him here for some Sunday to come and speak so that if you don't know him, you can get to know him. Uh, the man loves the Lord. He loves children. Imagine ministering to children out wherever, for over 35 years, in their neighborhoods, on their turf, in some tough places. That's a heart that's working from above, folks, from above. So we have that going. And the last thing I'm going to mention, you'll see there is, OK, so it's getting close to gardening time, right? So you'll see if you get the picture up here, OK? The garden plots are out there. What you need to start doing is get a team together. There's six or seven plots. Get a team together, OK? And you can decide what you're gonna what you're gonna have planted in there, okay? Oh, look, he's, he's Joe's fighting with the things I set up. <laughs> it's okay, it, 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 it's in there, and uh, we want to have some fun. Uh, it's great to have the garden going out there. Uh, it makes us a light to the community. I mean, you know, the building's cool. I like it. All right, all these things, but we need to be a light to this community. That's why we're here. It's not a social club, though we socialize. Okay, all these things happen. Ah, basically, yeah, Vacation Bible School, yeah. This is last year's program, so please, folks, uh, put that in your calendar. It's going to be a good time. You're going to enjoy it. It's going to be great. But with that, they're trying to get it straight about that. I've got them all messed up. Don't worry. You know what? We're going to close out in a song, and then that'll be running. I got Joe all messed up, you know? I got them all messed up. With the, pre, where, where are my singers? So I have see one singer. Where's my other singer? She's a zinger. Come on up here, young lady. Folks, we're going to close in a song. Please stand. Please stand. Yes. Huh? Oh, offering. Sorry. So uh, uh, we do take up an offering here at Calvary Baptist Church. Uh, please keep that in mind. The plates are down here, and you can do it online as well. It's really good, but after service, just, you know, Put your gold to bullions in there, your talents, everything, you know. Give it up. Give it up. What are you going to do? All right? Let's close in a, in a song. How lovely is 
your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. For my soul longs and ever faints for you. For here my heart is satisfied within your presence. I sing beneath the shadow of your wings. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day course than a thousand elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere, than a thousand elsewhere. 